from the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, innovation, and much more. This is Metro Focus with Rafael P. Roman. Tonight, Detroit is bankrupt and public pensions are in peril. Is this something that the taxpayers should be spending their money on versus investment in something like a new subway? A hate crime murder on Long Island that is still raising questions. Upgrading your electronics? Find out where the old ones wind up. We will ship out to our recyclers anywhere between 20 and 40,000 pounds of e-waste a week. And art in the public domain, the murals of New York City. Funding for this program is made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following. Hello, I'm Rafael Piroman. Welcome to Metro Focus. Detroit's bankruptcy and the startling court ruling that public workers' pensions can be cut to help bring the city back to financial stability are big news in every city and state. In New York City, the cost of pensions for public employees went from $1.4 billion when Mayor Bloomberg first took office to just over $8 billion this year. Those skyrocketing costs mean that New York City's new mayor, Bill de Blasio, may be facing trouble as he tackles his first city budget in 2014. To get an overview of this complex issue, I spoke with Nicole Gelinas of the Manhattan Institute and James Parrott, Deputy Director and Chief Economist at the Fiscal Policy Institute. This segment is part of a new project that will examine public pension shortfalls and what they may mean for governments, workers, retirees, and taxpayers. It was produced in conjunction with our colleagues at the Pension Peril. Joining me now are Nicole Gelinas and James Parrott. We'll talk in just a moment, but first, Here's what Mayor Bloomberg had to say about the state of New York City's public pensions. When we came into office, New York City's pension costs were $1.4 billion. By fiscal 2009, even after one of the strongest bull markets we've ever seen and before any impact from the financial meltdown, pension costs had grown to $6.9 billion. So clearly, our increase in annual pension costs, which today total more than $8 billion per year, was not driven primarily by poor market returns. It was the results of a benefit structure that promises retirees too much too soon and requires them to contribute too little to pay for it. At the same time that our pension costs can be substantially reduced, the idea that our pension costs can be substantially reduced through increased market returns is a fantasy, perpetuated to avoid the hard choices that we must confront today. Avoiding the hard choices is how Detroit went bankrupt, and it's the road to ruin for any city. Well, James, is uh, the mayor right? Uh, are the exploding pension costs leading New York, or could they lead New York yeah. uh, to Detroit? Um, I certainly don't think so. I mean, uh, the mayor talks about this tremendous increase since 2001. What people need to keep in mind is that pension contributions on the part of the city were extraordinarily low in that period, much lower than what they were through most of the 1990s and 1980s relative to the city budget overall. So it's not surprising that there was an increase over that time. And, and while that was before the that market much of crash, that, well, bef that was before the market crash of 2008, 2009, but there was a dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s. And part of the reason why those contributions level levels were elevated in 2008 and 2009 was because of the poor market returns then, so, you know, these are pensions that for the average city worker, you know, amount to 19 or $20,000 a year. It's part of their overall compensation package. It helps compensate them for the fact that their wages, when you adjust for their education and experience on the job, are less than a comparable private sector worker makes. Well, Nicole, are we on the road to Detroit if we keep this up? We're not on the road to Detroit in that we're not going bankrupt anytime soon. The problem is if we don't think about this as a serious issue, it's something that could happen, you know, five years, 10 years, even longer down the road. And the people who would suffer the most if we don't take this seriously and level with the municipal workers are the workers and retirees themselves, as we see in Detroit. The figure of $19,000 pension for the average retired city worker is a little bit misleading 
because this includes civilian workers who have been retired already for 20, 30 years. The reality is if you take a job as a city police officer today, you can work for 22 years, meaning you can retire in your 40s or your 50s. You'll live, uh, hopefully, another 30 years after that, and your spouse may live even longer than you. And so if you retire with, say, $120,000 salary, which is uh, perfectly uh, expected for a police officer, you'll get $60,000, even higher if you retire with a disability pension, for the rest of your life, it, longer in a lot of cases yeah, than you worked. That's unsustainable, according The to you. question is, yes, it's, it's unsustainable. And is this something that the taxpayers should be spending their money on versus investment in something like a new subway? Sure, but in that speech, the, uh, the mayor seemed to be challenging the next mayor about the pensions, but, but can Mr. de Blasio really do anything about the pensions? Isn't that really said in Albany? There are things that the new the mayor-elect can do. Oh, yes, pensions are set in Albany, but all of these things, salary, pensions, and health care costs, go together. For example, many people have heard that all of the city's labor contracts with the municipal workforce, almost 300,000 workers, are all expired. They've been expired in some cases for four and five mm. years. The new mayor certainly can't give any retroactive raises um, because the city simply can't afford it. But even going forward for future raises, uh, the, you know, people's raise money has gone toward pension and health care benefits. You can't have raises when these pension benefits are just going up and up. Okay, James, you want to respond to that quickly? Yeah, uh, uh, the projection is that pension costs, the pension contribution on the part of the city you know, they've pretty much leveled off. They're growing, but, you know, it's two, three, four, five percent a year or so on. And keep in mind that over the past four years, the pension funds, the city pension funds, have seen market returns of 12 percent on average. So that's, that's going to allow the city to reduce its projected contributions mm -hmm. even further. Uh, yeah, but $8 billion is $8 billion. It, it, yeah, How are sure. you going to deal it's, with that? It, it's a lot of money, but the trend line is, you know, the, the city's e economy is expanding 4 or 5 percent a year. Yeah. Our tax base is growing accordingly, a little bit faster than that, actually. So in the yeah. scheme of things, the, the city's ability to, to pay that is getting under control. But you, you, you ask, what can the mayor-elect do about yeah. the pension fund situation? Well, he can change the way that the city manages its pension uh, fund. Right yeah. now, it uses a lot of outside pension fund managers. Yeah, costing about half a billion dollars. It costs the city a lot of money. Uh, most large pension funds, the size of the five New York City pension funds, have in-house managers who uh, have performance uh, results that are uh, at least comparable to what the Wall Street yeah. Yeah. investment managers get. So the city could save a lot of money right there just by bringing that investment uh, management uh, function in-house. So, you know, as we all know, the, the judge that is ruling over the bankruptcy proceeding in Detroit just recently ruled that even pensions of retirees can be cut in the bankruptcy procedures. What does it mean for cities across yeah. the country and for New York City? Well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, but I think there's a significant legal issue here because it's a question. The judge basically ruled that federal bankruptcy law preempts state constitutional prote uh, protections for pension funds. So mm -hmm. this is a state's rights issue in a sense, and it'd be interesting to see if it gets to the Supreme Court how they, how they rule on that. We wouldn't have gotten to this point, though, if the governor of Michigan hadn't decided to basically cut Detroit loose mm -hmm. because they have significant long-term liabilities, but a lot of these are liabilities that come due over the next mm -hmm. few decades. And so these are not all liabilities that are due today. Uh, and it was basically a short-term cash flow problem that yeah. precipitated the bankruptcy, and that was partly a function of the fact that the state of Michigan just cut, cut right. back on aid to Detroit. So, so, Nicole, what needs to be done? What needs to change? Well, there, you know, first of all, James mentioned the issue of the fees that the city pays to Wall Street firms. You're right, that's about half a billion dollars a year. But even if the city cut that in half, which it should, these fees are far too high, the agreements that the city signs with the hedge funds and so forth are too opaque. But that savings is necessary, but saving maybe $250, 300000000 million a year does not fix the pension problem. So what problem. needs to be done? 
in, in, in the long seconds. term, <laughs> the, we've, we've got to raise the retirement age. We've got to ask city workers to pay more for, for their own pensions. Right now, the city taxpayer puts in $8 for every dollar that the city worker puts in. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've, we've got to think about how long should a person expect to work, the days when people can retire late 40s, early 50s, even early 60s in the private sector are certainly over, should be true in the public sector as well. We've already seen state pension reform. For, so for new city workers, the retirement age did go up, their contribution level did go That's up. That's something that Cuomo pushed right. uh, last Not year. Not for uniform right. workers, Not though. For okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hate crimes are on the rise in New York State. A report issued in November showed a 30% increase from 2011 to 2012. The increase is so dramatic that the New York controller, Tom DiNapoli, is ordering an investigation of local police departments reporting of hate crimes. The largest number of attacks were in New York City and in Suffolk County on Long Island. It was just over five years ago in the Suffolk County town of Patchogue that a white teenager named Jeffrey Conroy stabbed and killed a 37-year-old Ecuadorian immigrant named Marcelo Lucero. Before the murder, Conroy and six other teenage boys had been stalking other Latinos, a regular pastime, which they called hunting for beaners. Conroy was convicted of manslaughter as a hate crime and of assault against three other Hispanic men. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison, while the other six participants pled guilty to various charges. Town officials were accused of knowing about the hate crime attacks, but doing little to stop them and a four-year investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice resulted in mandatory oversight of the town's police and other agencies. Veteran journalist and Columbia School of Journalism professor Mirta Hito investigates the crime in the community in her new book, Hunting Season, Immigration and Murder in an All-American Town. I asked Ojito what drew her to this story. First of all, I am the mother of three Latino boys, so I was immediately drawn to the story. Also, I have been covering immigration for all of my professional life. But I think also, you know, I wanted to understand the soul of a place where seven teenagers can feel empowered to attack and kill, in this case, kill an immigrant, but to go out hunting for immigrants. Um, and also a very important part is that I am an immigrant myself. I came from Cuba in the 1980, Mariel Boatlift. Yeah. And all of us, 125,000 who came in that boat lift, were very quickly saddled with a label, Marielito, mm. which was uh, meant to be derogatory, although I actually like it and mm -hmm. use it quite a bit myself. Um, so I knew the importance of labels and how dangerous they can be. Mm. And clearly these immigrants were attacked because they were illegal or aliens. Mm. And I wanted to understand the dynamic of that. You know, the name of the book is Hunting Season. Yes. And it's not just a metaphor. I mean, you read the book and it, you kind of get ill and angry and sad because, because that's what was really happening, right? And the prey were these helpless illegal immigrants. How, how, is, how did that happen in America? Well, you know, it, um, it's happened for a long time. It certainly happened in Suffolk County, and it's continuing to happen, to happen sadly. Um, in this case, it happened for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, these people were defenseless, um, and often they would not call the police when they were first attacked. And if the police, or if the police were called, the police would say, you know, they're kids. They'll be out in no time. Let's not pursue it. Mm -hmm. And this isn't me saying that. The Justice Department has said that. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of them, knowing what would happen, wouldn't even call the police. Also, because they were undocumented, they were afraid. So then they would just simply take it and go home. Mm -hmm. In the case of Marcelo Lucero, it was different because he actually fought back. Right. That I know of, he was the first one who, instead of running away, he fought back. Mm -hmm. And it cost him his life. But talk a little bit about the town, Petrog, and, and the surrounding towns. What is it like? I mean, was it, was it particularly intolerant? Was it, was it racist or, or, or not? You know, it's intolerance and racism are really difficult um, characteristics to pin down or, or, or to um, label a town with. And I'm very careful. I hope that, that it shows in the hunting it season does. that I was very careful in doing that. You have to understand that this happened at a time where feelings against immigrants were 
particularly bad at that point in the United States, not only in Suffolk County, where this took place, but also in the United States and in the world. There was an unprecedented number of people on the move. Um, in fact, there are more immigrants in the world right now than at any other time in history. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, the elected officials in Suffolk County, um, really the rhetoric was left much to be desired. Among some of them? Among some yeah, of among them. some of them. Many of them, yeah. I would say. I mean, there was really a lot of anti-immigrant feeling, and these kids grew up with that. Yeah. I think that they were taught to dehumanize immigrants from the time they were children. But what do elected officials who had some grievance, I mean, who, who legitimately had some grievances against some of the things you yourself point right. out, right. Uh, you know, some of the behaviors that they were not acculturated to, how do they address that without fearing that they're going to be inciting people to do what these kids are doing? I think the language is important. I think one thing that I learned with this book is that words matter. If we're constantly saying that people are illegal, not just that they're here illegally, but they are, in fact, illegal people. If we call them invaders, if we talk about a uh, Mexican invasion, if we talk about anchor babies, all of those phrases, and what we do in the media, you know, I'm a journalist, I have been a journalist for a long time, and we haven't always done the best job that we possibly can in the media. Uh, Marcelo Lucero's brother said that hunting season was over mm. after uh, these kids were convicted. Mm -hmm. Was hunting season over? Uh, no, clearly it's not over. Um, it's not over anywhere. In fact, very recently, a man with a turban and a beard was attacked in Harlem. Mm -hmm. a Col I mean, a Columbia professor, a doctor. Um, and in Patchogue itself, people have been attacked as recently as this year. Really, over the last five years, nothing has changed. Well, yes, a lot has changed. Talk about but a lot. Are. A lot has changed in the sense that I think the community woke up. First of all, some of the elected officials that that they had back then have retired or they're no longer in politics. So the Hispanics don't feel like prey anymore as they want in the streets? It's hard to know. I, you know I, I don't like to make that generalization, but I think what they feel now is heard. In fact, the ones who were attacked, the first person they went to see was the mayor. Okay. That was not happening before. That's okay. a big change. Well, Mita, thank you so much. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. At this time of the year, many of us are thinking about buying or upgrading our electronic devices. But do you ever wonder what happens to the old models? Starting in 2015, it will be illegal to send electronics to landfills in New York State. And for the industry that deals in scrap metals and electronics, the new law is opening the way for a unique business. Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism student Thomas Showmaker takes us to one of the new e-waste companies in the Gowanus section of Brooklyn. My name is Samuel Huntington, and I am the manager of the Lower East Side Ecology Center's e-waste warehouse. I'm a musician of sorts, so I enjoy keeping around and trying to fiddle with some of the keyboards that we get in. Disposing of these machines through conventional methods is extremely hazardous to the environment and, you know, ultimately hazardous to everyone's well-being. We get a lot of flat-screen TVs. A lot of them are relatively contemporary models. Many of them are built pretty poorly and built with uh, pieces that are, are made to wear out after a very specific period of time. In many situations, the manufacturers have made it difficult to obtain those replacement parts for repairs or made those parts so expensive that it makes more sense just to buy a new television. During a busy event season, we will ship out to our recyclers anywhere between 20 and 40,000 pounds of e-waste a week. Since I've started here, we've launched our resale program and opened up our reuse store for refurbished electronics. The goal is to divert as much of that material from the recycling stream into the reuse stream as possible. As a warehouse that collects electronics, you know, you shop around like anything else for the best deal. 
and the companies that will pay the best rates per pound while at the same time working within the confines of our ethical and environmental mission. So we're not going to work with scrappers who send electronics overseas. It's certainly a good thing that that portion of the law is going into effect. We will definitely see an uptick in drop-offs. The most surprising thing that you see on a daily basis is machines that were once desirable a relatively short time ago and are now just considered disposable and unwanted. It speaks to the both the, the idea of planned obsolescence, but then also the way that we as consumers and, and citizens treat machines. We want the newest thing and once we get that set in our minds, the older models, even if they're relatively recent, you know, the last model is no longer a desirable commodity. It's art meant for everyone to see. Murals painted by some of the world's most famous artists are all around us in New York City, but you do need to know where to look. Now, 33 of the greatest murals are in one collection, a book of photos and stories called Murals of New York City. Author Glenn Palmer Smith and photographer Joshua McHugh joined me recently to share some of the photographs and the stories behind the massive paintings. Gentlemen, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a wonderful book. Why did you decide to do it, Glenn? Um, because it had never been done. Um, that we are a city of murals, even though we're not known as a city of murals. And uh, you walk through the streets and through these buildings surrounded by these incredible works of art and they become like wallpaper. So I thought it would be important to draw attention to them, you know, sure. bring them together to stop and smell the cappuccino, look at a mural. <laughs> you know, they're beautiful, they're gorgeous, and yeah. we're, we're lucky to have them. How difficult was it to photograph these murals to be able to convey in a photograph what the artists were able to display? on the wall? Uh, some were easy, some were incredibly difficult. Um, it really depended on the setting uh, and the way the ambient light was working. Uh, there were many cases where we had uh, to just to go in and, and be at the, at the right place at the right time and do that. Other ones required a lot of uh, rearranging of lights and, and creating What was things. the hardest one? The hardest one? Uh, Rockefeller Center was very tricky, mostly because the, uh, the space is kind of unusual uh, and the existing lighting was uh, tricky to work with, mm -hmm. so that was a, a challenge. So you selected 33 right. murals. Do you have a favorite or favorites? Don't you hate it when people say whichever one I'm standing in front of? <laughs> I do hate that, so don't say that. <laughs> so I won't say that. The, the, probably the favorite is the cover of the St. Regis Bar, the King Cole mural, which is... And why? A t multiple reasons. One, it's a stunning painting. Uh, Maxfield Parrish was a genius, mm. just a, a, an amazing illustrator. The other is the backstory, which is that John Jacob Astor IV uh, hired him to paint this mural for a bar in a hotel that he was building at 42nd and Broadway. Yeah. And he paid him a lot of money, $5,000, $6,000 in 1905, which would have been, you know, what? $150,000. Uh, Parrish was a teetotaling, Quaker, patrician, uh, elegant guy, but commerce trumped virtue. He paints the mural. Then Astor adds insult to injury by insisting that his face be the face of King Cole. So Parrish gets his revenge on Astor and at the same time collects a bet because he was an egomaniac, thought he could paint anything. Yeah. So all of the artists of the day were always challenging him. They said, we will give you a subject you can't paint. So what was it? Paint a fart. <laughs> right? So there you have King Cole on his throne. And it's Aster. And it's Aster. And everybody in the mural is kind of going, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> like this. And they all kind of resemble Parrish. So he got, his, wow. he got his licks in. And, and, and Astor went down on their Titanic and evidently never got the, never got the joke uh -huh. carried, carried <laughs> to the bottom. Your favorite? My favorite. You know, my favorite, I'm not going to name one of them, but I will say that in the process of doing this, seeing ones that are not popular, not familiar, was really an eye-opener and very, very exciting. Um, Lucienne Block's work at, um, in Washington Heights at, at high school is fantastic. Um, Orozco Mural at the New School, another great one. 
um, one I'd never seen before at the general post office in the Bronx, the Ben Sean. Those were all beautiful eye-openers to me. Mm -hmm. As a native New Yorker, not knowing about them, and then in the process of making the book, seeing those was really fantastic. Glenn, is there anything unique about New York City murals? Yes, they're the best. <laughs> and they're the best because this is a collision of commerce and talent. It's where all the money is. So when the best people in the world, the best artists in the world, are engaged by the, by the people with the deepest pockets, it's just, it's inevitable that they're gonna be fantastic. And Joshua, uh, was there anything that surprised you as you were taking the photographs of these <clears throat> wonderful murals? Well, one of the things is when you take a photograph of something, you get to spend a lot of time with it. So even just uh, recognizing certain very fine details in something that you wouldn't have recognized if you were just passing by or looking at it casually, you get to spend time and see those things and you realize how, uh, uh, delicate and refined these works really are. Even though they're on a wall, if you look very closely at them, you see things and uncover things you wouldn't see otherwise. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What can we do to get New Yorkers to realize the treasures that surround them? Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good one. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a, it's, a, it, this is, it's a bit heavy to carry around with you, but the bulk of the murals are in, are in Manhattan and within a fairly uh, small area, so you can, you can see them. Okay. And it makes a, a magnificent Christmas. <laughs> All right. Opinion, but... Good plug. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. you can find out more about books and art and all our stories online at metrofocus.org. We want to thank you for making our first full year on the air a success. We'll be back in the new year, so join us then for more news, conversations, and in depth reporting from New York and New Jersey Public Television. I'm Rafael Piramon. Thanks for watching, and happy holidays from all of us here at Metro Focus. Funding for this program was made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following.